folks, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming on up. We're starting a little bit late. I hope that's okay for everybody. Thanks for coming in from out of the cold. This is the Under the Radar Professional Symposium, uh, number 11. 11. We have some people that have been here almost every time. Every time. Every time. And we we've got our, forgot our gold stars. Um, are there some folks with that have are fresh here, have not been to an Under the Radar? Good. That's what. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Mark Russell, and this is me and Wong. We're the co directors of this festival. Um, and uh, you may notice we're in a different room, and it's a smaller room. And that changed our thinking about this a bit. And uh, you may have noticed you had to apply. No. Okay. Anyway, um, we're getting more and more bureaucratic over here. At, they're, they're, they're teaching me things at the public, you know? I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't sneak people in anymore. It's sick. But, um, yeah. All right, so, um, Maine, do you have some things you want to say? I haven't said anything. Okay, great. Okay, I'm go. Gonna, okay. Yeah. Um, so, hello, everybody. Welcome. Oh, your lights just went. Um, so, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I know it's no small thing for everybody to come from wherever you have come and uh, through the cold uh, to reconsider what we're doing. You know, I always think January is a you know, crazy time to be in New York because of all the work, but really a time for all of you guys and us together. Um, so, for example, um, what we're trying to do this year, as Mark was saying, in terms of the um, symposium is really to figure out what we're doing and what we can do to make better work and to work better. And so for example, what Under the Radar has done this year is to figure out how we can make this work from New York and Switzerland. Um, so, uh, but I think uh, uh, we're very excited for you to see the festival. And uh, one of the things I really wanted to point out was um, a new program that uh, we have, we're testing. It's not officially launched, I guess, but it's the Device Theater uh, Working Group's incoming series, uh, which is our festival within the festival. So just to give you a little context about the program, uh, we have basically invited eight uh, up-and-coming New York uh, companies and artists, or what we want to call uh, next generation, people that you probably or perhaps has not, have not um, uh, come into contact with. Before. So really, we have been convening them for over the last uh, half a year and uh, inviting them for uh, conversations at the public with us and with each other to really figure out how they make their work both aesthetically and um, practically and uh, the combination of it really is this incoming uh, platform uh, a festival within the festival so when you see it these are works in pro process these are artists who are in various stages of development of that particular piece so please uh, see it with those eyes but uh, we're very, very excited. They have really infused so much energy into the program and um, what we're doing for uh, Under the Radar and other public. Um, and so the, the uh, demand has actually, and the response from uh, you guys in the public have really been really fantastic. So if you can't see it, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, watch out for these names. Really watch out for these names. So we actually also really want to thank the organizations um, who really have supported Under the Radar um, from its beginning formative years with the Doris Duke uh, Charitable Trust and the Andrew Mellon Foundation, which really um, lifted this festival and sort of just uh, let it take off. And to the extraordinary, thank you. Also to the extraordinary support uh, this year from the Howard Gilman Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation. Uh, thank you so much for your support. And um, so that is the official uh, thank you section. And now I would like to uh, say we also could not do this without the deep support of the institution where we are here, our home, the public theater. Um, and we are now a core program of the public. Um, with big plans for the future. And so I would like to introduce you to our executive director of the public, uh, Patrick Willingham. Patrick has transformed the public in the three, three, years, that you've, three years that you've been here and it has been a great pleasure um, working with him. So please welcome Patrick Willingham. Hey, thanks, Matt. This is my laugh line um, this morning. I'm not very 
funny for those of us who've been outside. But my coyote is always with me. Um, uh, this is truly one of our favorite times of the year around here at the public. And I was at the opening night celebration last night and looking around at all of the faces and all the youngins drinking it up. Um, after uh, a few of the shows had opened. And I, you know, I was just really struck, as I am every single year, by the composition of the people who are drawn to this work. Uh, you know, we hear so much about the graying of our audiences. And as I look around there, I see some gray hairs like my own, but I also see so many young and vibrant people who are so very, very interested in this work. For those of you who were here last year, I, I mentioned my husband who said, oh, these are my people. He's a little bit younger than I am. And I was like, yeah, that's right, that's right. And, and so it's true, right? And so as I, uh, as, as I was there last night, I was just struck by that again and, and just the relevance of this sort of work that you know we here at the public and, and elsewhere have been calling device theater. We know that's not a great label for it, but it's the one that we've, uh, for the moment, chosen to affix to it. Uh, and as I, um, as I spoke last year, we were just introducing our device theater initiative. And the device theater uh, working group that Mayen was talking about uh, was a key element of that initiative, really bringing in a group of, of younger artists and doing what we can as an institutional theater to help them develop. And I'm really excited to share with you guys um, another initiative that we've undertaken in the past year uh, that we're really sort of right in uh, the sort of beginning quarter to one third of. Um, we're part of the EMC Arts Innovation Lab, um, supported by Doris Duke. Thank you, Ben. Um, and uh, part of what we're doing with the Innovation Lab, EMC Arts is a consulting group. Uh, they've been working for the past seven or eight years, helping organizations become uh, more innovative and helping them to develop practices that really build that innovation muscle, which we're seeing you know, throughout the entire corporate world, throughout the entire startup world, that idea of innovation. How do we work better? How do we work smarter? How do we change the way that we're working? And we really felt, looking at uh, the device theater landscape, that this was a completely new way of working, that institutional theaters had not necessarily known exactly how to, um, to mesh with. So the exploration we're doing, the challenge that we're exploring with the EMC Innovation Lab is how can we better work with, better understand, better learn from, better grow with these, uh, these new and fresh ways of developing work. And we're hoping that we not only learn things for the public theater, but that we also learn things that we can share with the entirety of the field. It just feels like there's, there, there are so many opportunities. And you know, back to my, my beginning comment of looking at the audiences who are attracted to this work and looking at the audiences base that we need to continue to build as an institutional theater, I think there's just, there's just a really holy union, uh, I think, that can happen there. And I'm very excited uh, that we're able to engage in that process. And again, just very grateful to EMC Arts and Doris Duke. With that, I'm just really happy you guys are here. I hope you have a blast at the festival. I hope the symposium uh, brings you everything you need, the selected few who are in the room. Um, stay warm, and uh, we'll see you around the theater. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Mario Garcia Durham from uh, the Arts Presenters, Associate of Performing Arts Presenters. UTR was a project of arts presenters for many years. Just come on. Many of you might know Mario from his time at Europe Buena, the National Endowment for the Arts, and now, of course, Arts Presenters. He has been a strong presenter of new theater and has been really uh, great in trying to bring all of the crazy festivals in New York together uh, the, for the past two years. So um, welcome him to the stage. Thank you all. Thank you, Marianne and Mark and Patrick. Um, yeah, what what uh, Man just mentioned is really great. I think I mentioned last year that um, we started working together with all of the uh, amazing festivals and convenings that take place here in January. We really tried to spread the word in a very consolidated and, and strategic way. And I think with the stories coming out in the papers, uh, the focus of journalists were starting to to get that story across, because it really is an amazing time here in January uh, for all of these performing arts professionals and curators from around the world to come and, and share and see new work. Um, I, uh, 
uh, wanted to also say that, uh, you know, Patrick mentioned about the grain audiences, and I, I, I really think there needs to be another category, the had hairs. Um, <laughs> there, darn it. And anyway, <laughs> start referring to that. But I wanted to um, also say that uh, Arts Presenters is so proud to uh, be, be part of this and to support this. Um, Sandra Gibson, somewhere in the audience here, I want to give kudos yeah. to Sandra. She actually started this. <laughs> Um, we um, um, wanted to let you know uh, just quickly that tomorrow we have our speed dating session there at the Hilton. We have every year. It's from 9 until noon at the Petit Trianon. And um, um, I'll close by just saying, in these days of the wonderful, blissful joys of technology and all that it brings, which I kind of do across to, uh, I'm so happy to be here at an event that focuses on artists as humans creating work and offering all that we can in this crazy age of technology. So I'm so, so happy to be here and to support this work. So thank you all. Thank you, Mario. Thank you so much. Um, so when Mayan and I were trying to decide who would be an appropriate keynote speaker for this year's symposium, she said, hey, uh, take a look at this video of Christy Edmonds. Uh, it was a video of her remarks at the Institute for Cultural Practice in Performance at Wesleyan University at ICPP. And uh, it's on their website, you can see the video. I, I had known of uh, Christy's eloquence. I consider her the most articulate leader in contemporary performance today. But this video blew me away, it, with its understated but deep investigation of our field and what it means to be a presenter, curator, at this moment in our history. We both decided that that was the key to shaking up our symposium this year. Our experiences with a project we call the Director Circle led us to believe that now was a good time to re-engage the people that come to UTR. There is so much knowledge in this room. Each of you could do a keynote speech. So we have come up with the breakout format that we are going to try today. And it will be, it's a risk. It's, you know, go with us, be gentle. Um, but it's also on you. You have to make this symposium work for you. I want you to meet new people uh, and uh, exchange ideas. And let's see what we can get going here. Christy is a great leader in our field. She is a curator, writer, educator, and crucially, a performance visual art artist, uh, filmmaker, and dance maker in her own right, which is key because she's an incredible advocate for artists in our world, always finding new strategies to support their creativity and move forward. You can read about Christy in your symposium packet, but do not do that now. <laughs> Prepare to listen. You need to know that she was the founder of the Portland Institute of Contemporary Art in Portland, Oregon. She later completely remade that organization from a venue-centered uh, entity to one more fluid and focused on the time-based arts festival, a festival that has come to become one of the most important contemporary performance festivals in this country. Christy left PICA for Melbourne, Australia, where she ran the Melbourne International Festival for the Arts in an unprecedented four years. She was instrumental in designing the artistic program for the Park Avenue Armory and curated some of the defining early performances there, giving this city, my city, finally a place where works of great scale could be seen. She is now the executive and artistic director of the Center for the Art of Performance at UCLA, UCLA CAP. Again, taking a presenting organization program and bringing it into the 21st century with a radical reimagining. Many of you have sat around panel tables with Christy and seen her speak or interview. We have asked her to speak today because Christy has a particular call to arms that resonates with me and with Mei Yin 
and should resonate with the field today. I hope that you can inspire and reaffirm in you the reason that we all take on this work. She has done that for me time and time and time again. Please welcome Christy Evans. particular kinds of themes that, that uh, or threads that Under the Radar are working on, but I definitely know that looking out into this group of people, why I'm shaking is not the cold, it's that I'm encountering a kind of grace. There's a grace of your work and your endeavor, and when I stand in front of you, I feel this overwhelm of appreciation. I'm supposed to be doing this thing right now where I talk about from where I stand, shaking at my little podium here. Um, and I think it's really about trying to, how do I elicit something from myself that actually is about us? And in trying to do that and thinking around a lot of things, it's also about a bit of a, we're here to take a kind of stock in theater, in performance, in international exchange, in the work of these ephemeral forms of kind of human history and human heritage that we have a role in holding, creating space for, and deeply delving into extremely well. I'm part of a sea of all of you that does that. I'm part of the privilege of being able to work with artists with an acute attentiveness to what they're seeking to do, as do all of us. And what I think with Under the Radar and the, and the kind of symposiums in the, in the next few days and what you all do here, it's kind of less about a stock take about the conditions that we face and more about how together we face them. And I don't want to dwell on that facing, that kind of bracing of a time of exponential change, but really about the privilege of what it means to be able to work deeply and gently and with wit and with <coughs> integrity of purpose around how culture through theater and through live performance moves and keeps our society awake to the world differently. Recently I've had a number of different kind of fragments and I'm gonna go through some of them. But it's a pretty interesting thing because knitting together fragments is also part of paying attention. And I've found increasingly that in my own work and in my own practice, the subtle and small are increasingly the things that I'm trying to weave across the way in which I listen to artists and listen to audiences. I know we spend a lot of time focusing on strategies. And what I think actually is that we're focusing a lot on the tactics of how we tackle what we face and less about the actual active strategy of purpose, the purpose of why. In performance, no matter if it's dance, no matter if it's jazz, no matter if it's different forms of music, no matter if it's theater, I find us, as a field, increasingly asked to talk about the what. What is it? What will it be? And, and, and one of the things that I've been thinking about is that it's actually more pertinent and relevant for us now to give a little less to the what of it and a huge amount to the why of it and make that visible to people and make that offered and shared. Theater for me is an interesting, I'm a visual artist. Um, I didn't, and, and I worked in film. And this thing Mark mentioned about dance, I choreographed one dance once on a ballet company. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I gotta strike that from wherever all that exists. <laughs> on the internet. Um, but one of the things that's interesting for me about theater is that is, is a little bit of a life portrait, and I'm, I'm gonna share it with you because I think it's part of what still happens. My mother was born on an Indian reservation, the Okanagan Indian Reservation in Washington State. I was born not far from there in a very small lake tourist town, Lake Chelan. Because of a series of random accidents, as somebody who came from a small community and a very specific kind of cultural community, 
we were also a family that on one side was working the land as apple pickers, and on the other hand, were working in engineering and bridge building my grandfather. It was my grandfather that through his bridge building lifted my family out of being kind of migrant apple picking people. But when I was taught to pick apples, I was taught to do it with a certain kind of care. And as a young person climbing in those trees, the way in which you approach the apple and how you leave it, it's what you, you have to take the apple, but you have to leave the spur. You can't be careless in the holding of these. And there was something about that that I continue to think about when I curate. And people ask me a lot, like, how do I go about it or what do I, and I always feel that it's both the act of the picking of an apple, but what you leave in place so that the other ones continue to grow and how to make space for those things. Because of a random set of bizarre sort of accidents, we ended up moving to Minneapolis. And this is when I first encountered theater. Again, you wouldn't necessarily, um, I, I never, my family wouldn't, my father, for example, no way on earth was he gonna take us to theater. In fact, if my mother, who was the person who would generate these experiences for my sister and myself, if she wasn't at the forefront of doing it, there would be no way that it would happen. And when my father was forced to attend these various theatrical events on occasion, um, like the Chanhausen's Children's Theater or you know things like this, it, it was like watching somebody be in excruciating pain. <laughs> if I had an encounter with the theater, um, which thankfully the public schools allowed pop to be possible at that time in history, um, <laughs> at that long ago graying now time in history, um, and I would try and share the story that I had encountered or the thing that I had seen or this. This, this thing that happened in front of me from my seat. With my dad, he would say, you know, when you finish this story, I can help you with your math. <laughs> I can help you with your math homework. So what I guess I mean is that it was a random set of accidents and a choice that my mother had made to make sure that I had access to theater. As a, again, I'm a visual artist. And I moved in those directions even though I had theater in my background. And it wasn't until I went into college, and I was a film student, and I finished in Berlin, West Berlin at the time, that I encountered a different kind of theater. It wasn't the theater that, f that fell in convention. It was the theater that happened in unusual ways. We're calling kind of devised theater, or high provocation of contemporary theater. And while I was a visual artist, and while I was a filmmaker, what happened to me in these spaces that, that were in kind of underground locations or at the Schauburner is that there was something that made me feel more connected <coughs> to being awake and alive to myself and possibility and listening that set me into a path that involved live performance and probably forecasted that I would become a curator. And through all of this, I began to possess a fascination and compassion for how art is made and what it does how we figure, how we form, and then share it with one another, and what it is to be conscious and to live, or to have lived. And an attentiveness started to arise in terms of like how we see, how we imagined and treated our times and our place and our cultures and our earth and our song lines and our verbal utterances and our heritage. And I'm always trying to see what's there. And I often think that the act of concentrated attentiveness to what's there is a kind of um, prayer in the arts. So I do think that in many cases, my work and our work is an act of attention. And it's disciplined in its searching. And it's disciplined in its support of meaning and meaningfulness. When we get together, we talk about strategies. <clears throat> and to me, I think my strategy now is to be an acutely attentive listener to certain possibilities. <clears throat> I'm gonna go through a few little fragments that are disconnected and disassociated, but I think they matter, and I just feel like sharing them, and I don't know what I'm doing anyway. So, <laughs> one, an older arts <clears throat> patron um, at a theater show that I had presented recently. He's an older gentleman um, in Los Angeles, and, and he doesn't often come to things, and he used to come to things a lot. And this, of course, has my board in a kind of, you know, 
vexation. <clears throat> and I asked him about it, and he said, I know that the work, he means this piece of theater, I know that the work was very good. My problem is that I do not know how to be settled with it. I don't know how to be settled at it. I can't seem to settle at all. There's nothing in it that I can lean back on. I cannot rest against myself in this theater. I don't mean that it's unsettling exactly. I mean that I cannot feel relief. And then he said, do you think this is the condition of what younger artists are experiencing all the time? Or am I succumbing to my own maturing and complacency interests? <laughs> where the only thing that I gravitate towards is if it's possible that I will feel the sublime, not the unsettled. What will it look like in the future? And what can I do? Which I think is worth sharing. The other day, I just flew back from Australia, and in coming through customs, my six-year-old son, his name is Ashby, <clears throat> as we were re-entering, my wife, his mother, was getting fingerprinted in the scanner glass thing there, which of course, as a US citizen, I don't have to be, but she, as a green card holder, does have to be. And our six-year-old turns to me quietly, while this is going on, for an explanation about what <clears throat> exactly his mother is doing with her hands on that glass thing. And after my highly simplified answer, <clears throat> he said, I don't want them to take my fingerprints from me. They're mine. Sort of, they're sort of like a private thing at the end of my hand. <laughs> what to do with that thing? <laughs> You're the theater maker. <laughs> Ten-year-old son, after being home in America again for a couple of days, he said to me, I think that I fart more when I'm in America than when I do when I'm in Australia. <laughs> do you think that's possible? And if so, why? Why would I fart more in America than when I'm in Australia? Principles of uncertainty do matter. <laughs> they matter a lot. I've been wondering a lot lately as well <clears throat> where the central office of rulemaking is. I wonder what their desks are looking like and if they have a window at all. <laughs> and if they do have one, what on earth are they looking out at? <laughs> Recently, I taught a course at UCLA called Art of Social Action. I took over for Peter Sellers, which was you know, daunting. In the process of doing it, I asked the students in their journals to talk about the thing that they felt, and this is now the millennium, the millennials, right? I asked them what they felt the most kind of sense of pressure around in their becoming. And 63% of them, I'm using a percentage because increasingly I have to, um, <clears throat> as if it matters, 63, not 62.25, not 65, 63% of the students in one way or another in the context of what they journaled about had said that they felt that was most at risk for them was their curiosity. They felt a lament about it, but because it isn't going to help them efficiently progress through their extremely costly degrees, curiosity was a kind of luxury that they couldn't afford and they knew it. That's a fragment that we have to tend to. And the other day in Los Angeles, California, <clears throat> at the Hammer Art Museum, an exhibition was closing by the artist, the visual artist, the great visual artist, Jim Hodges. It's an exhibition that toured. It was at the Walker, and it was just at the Hammer. And it's called Give More Than You Take. So on all of the marketing materials, on all of the banners, on all of the billboards, on everything that was there, Jim's aptly titled exhibition, Retrospective, it's called Give More Than You Take. 
And of course, I was only in LA for a couple of days before being here in the bracing cold. I thought my face was going to fall off this morning. I thought it had fallen off. In fact, has my face fallen off? <laughs> I watched one of the, on the way to the airport, one of the um, billboards that I've been loving seeing across that city of extraordinary extraction and transaction and beauty and wonder and palm trees. Uh, I watched the words give more than you take come off as they put the new brand of coach baggage up. And I thought, how long will we remember to give more than we take? 11% of my time now, I realize, is spent actively in the you know, leadership role writing letters of recommendation writing and providing evidence. Now I'm in an academic institution, and in that case, if you even encounter a librarian or did anything with them, because of your title, you might be asked when they go up for a promotion to write on their behalf. It, it's, it's a kind of interesting thing, and I bring it up because there's a kind of way in which writing these letters of recommendation and attesting to them when we used to write these letters, we wrote from the position of both knowledge and care that the individual was being surrounded by our testify of their capacities and their potential. And now, it's kind of more like, as long as I have, for the recipient or the seeker of these letters, as long as I have at least three letters that state that this person, A, exists, and B, is reasonably good, you could kind of cut and paste the whole thing. It's a pursuit of us needing a kind of evidence before we take an action. An evidence, a box ticking, a file cabinet full of stuff before we take an action. And this to me is kind of a crux. If 10 or 11% of my time is to provide evidence so that someone else can make the right decision, I wonder what that means. I think in our field and in our profession, for a variety of different reasons, we're asked to think about the managerial aplomb of the role, the executive decision, the entrepreneurial decision, the monetary instrument, the creation of new strategies for creating a dynamic where the willingness to pay for culture will be marked with our capacity as a successful leader or not. But management is not what we will remember in our path. It is what we chose to lead from, which often requires the gut. I now believe that our most relevant strategy unto itself for theater, for art, for culture, is to leave high intentional evidence of care. That has got to be at the core of our endeavor, where our integrity of purpose is made visible and its impact can act as a gift of our labor to others. Not our entitlement, but our gift of our labor to the highest possible purpose of what I had said earlier. Fascination and compassion for how art is made and what it does how we figure and find form and share with one another what it is to be conscious and to live and to have lived. An attentiveness in how we see and how we imagined and treated our times, our place, our cultures, our earth, our song lines, our words, our artists, our heritage. That's our strategy. Thank you.
And so uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so after this, we're doing so good on time. Um, after this, you're going to go to coffee where you can do um, your catch up, say hi, and all of those things. At 11 o'clock is the breakout session, and it will be happening all around the building and across the street at 440 Lafayette. If you could look at your um, badge, this is a new thing. At the back, you should have an assignment of where you're supposed to go and um, uh, uh, who is facilitating.